Welcome in, folks, to our midweek Bible study, Lancaster Church of Christ. Glad you're able to be with us, and I uh, hope you're enjoying this uh, warming trend we're seeing uh, after a, a real winter. Uh, it's been nice uh, today not to wear a jacket <laughs> around, and I hope you're being able to get outside and enjoy it too. Uh, good to be together for a few minutes in God's Word. And we're going to continue what we began last week. Uh, we're looking at the 50th Psalm. And we'll do that tonight and, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. But I'm uh, glad you're, you're a part of it. And we'll get into that uh, in just a moment. Let's ask God's blessings on our study before we begin. <clears throat> Holy Father, thank you for being our God and for calling us into relationship with you. Uh, we want to know more and more about you and your son and more about how we can please you and be faithful servants. Please guide us as we study tonight uh, one of the great songs in your book and pray your blessings on all those who are a part of the study. Uh, help us to be more like Jesus and to not be selfish with the great treasure we found, but to share it with many. Thank you for always hearing us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So <clears throat> we began uh, last week with this idea, what's in a psalm? And in particular, talking about the 50th Psalm. And I hope uh, in our overview and our first uh, look at the first part of it last week that you got the answer, well, there's a lot in a psalm. Because uh, that, that's part of the purpose of, of the study. So we'll continue that tonight. First, a little bit of a review in case um, you weren't able to tune in last time. The 50th Psalm. Uh, can, can be divided into three basic parts. Uh, basically, the outline is verses 1 through 6, then verses 7 through 15, then verses 16 through 23. That's the three parts. And they each address a little bit different of an idea. Uh, it sounds and, and seems like a judgment psalm, so God is uh, judging people. Uh, the first section, God sort of comes into the courtroom. He, uh, he he shows up in great power and calls, we might say, court in session. And uh, it's very interesting, the descriptions that are used of what it's like when God shows up. And then in the middle part of the psalm, which we'll look at this evening, verses 7 through 15, God addresses his people, his worshipers, uh, which in the Old Testament, of course, would be Israel. And then in the last part of the psalm, verses 16 through 23, he turns to the group he calls the wicked. So again, we talked about how there's two different views. Is this uh, the wicked who are not part of Israel? That, that is uh, the people in the world in general. That's sort of the view I take. Uh, many people in reading this psalm uh, view the wicked in the psalm as unfaithful Israelites. Could be either. I'm not sure it changes the message so much, which it is. Uh, but that third group is addressed in the third section, verses 16 through 23. We also mentioned how uh, I think verse 21 is really a key in understanding the entire psalm. And we'll, we will uh, bring that up again tonight um, because in that 21st verse, God says, you thought that I was like you. And um, that comes into play throughout the psalm. We'll see how specifically it does um, this evening in this section we're gonna look at. So <clears throat> to begin, I wanted to read the psalm again. Last week we read it. Uh, there's 23 verses in it, so it takes a couple of minutes. But 
Uh, we read it from the English Standard Version, which is my go-to reading version. Uh, tonight I wanted to read it from a little bit different of a source and actually read it from a paraphrase. So this is not a translation I'm going to read, but it's a paraphrase. A paraphrase is, is uh, if you're not familiar, um, you know, putting it more into everyday language, whatever the everyday language is at the time the paraphrase is made. Uh, sometimes they're really well done, sometimes not so great. Um, but one of the popular paraphrases of recent years is called The Message. Um, the Message by Eugene Peterson. Uh, and I think in general, the message is well done. Uh, there are some parts that are better than others. Uh, if you want a really um, interesting take on the New Testament letters, if you're studying the New Testament letters, I think he does a really good job on most of those. And so it's sort of neat, for instance, to read the book of Ephesians in the message, this paraphrase, and then compare it with what you're used to hearing as you read Ephesians. Uh, and in the Psalms, I think Peterson does a pretty good job paraphrasing the Psalms. So uh, what I tend to do if I read a paraphrase is I have a standard translation alongside of it. So you might have one and sort of be eyeing that as I read uh, Peterson's paraphrase of Psalm 50. Um, and you'll see, if you're not familiar with paraphrase, you'll see how it sounds sort of different. Um, but also these can sometimes give pretty good insights. So I'm going to read uh, Psalm 50 from The Message by Eugene Peterson uh, to, to get our thinking into this psalm tonight. So it begins, The God of gods, it's God, speaks out, shouts, Earth, welcomes the sun in the east, farewells the disappearing sun in the west. From the dazzle of Zion, God blazes into view. Our God makes his entrance. He's not shy in his coming. Starbursts of fireworks precede him. He summons heaven and earth as a jury. He's taking his people to court. Round up my saints who swore on the Bible their loyalty to me. The whole cosmos attests to the fairness of this court that here God is judge. Are you listening, dear people? I'm getting ready to speak. Israel, I'm about ready to bring you to trial. This is God, your God, speaking to you. I don't find fault with your acts of worship, the frequent burnt sacrifices you offer. But why should I want your blue ribbon bull or more and more goats from your herds? Every creature in the forest is mine, the wild animals on all the mountains. I know every mountain bird by name. The scampering field mice are my friends. If I get hungry, do you think I'd tell you? All creation and its bounty are mine. Do you think I feast on venison or drink draughts of goat's blood? Spread for me a banquet of praise. Serve high God a feast of kept promises and call for help when you're in trouble. I'll help you and you'll honor me. Next, God calls up the wicked. What are you up to? Quoting my laws, talking like we are good friends. You never answer the door when I call. You treat my words like garbage. If you find a thief... You make him your buddy. Adulterers are your friends of choice. Your mouth drools filth. Lying is a serious art form for, with you. You stab your own brother in the back. Rip off your little sister. I kept a quiet patience while you did these things. You thought I went along with your game. I'm calling you on the carpet now laying your wickedness out in plain sight. Time's up for playing fast and loose with me. 
I'm ready to pass sentence and there's no help in sight. It's the praising life that honors me. As soon as you set your foot on the way, I'll show you my salvation. So again, that is uh, Peterson's uh, paraphrase, the message of, of Psalm 50. A little bit different, uh, but some, some fresh wordings, I guess, there. But let's think a little bit about uh, the middle part of this Psalm, verses 7 through 15 tonight. I was thinking uh, before, as I was preparing, you know, of uh, something from my younger years, my childhood. My dad, uh, when I was a young guy, uh, made me mow the grass, had me mow the grass at, at home. And uh, many of you may have had a similar chore. Now, we didn't live uh, on a farm where there were a lot of chores, but uh, there was a decent sized backyard. And it was my job once I was old enough to, to mow the grass. And I was reflecting on why did, uh, why did my dad um, give me the jo job of mowing the grass? He was in good health. Uh, he could mow the grass. He had time to do it. And at least when started out, no doubt, he would have done a better job than me. I'm sure uh, there was a lot of um, imperfections in my craft of mowing uh, early on until I got the hang of it. But dad had me do it and expected me to do it. Why? Was it because he needed me to do it? No. Um, was it because he was incapable of doing it? No. Was it because I could do a better job than him? No. He didn't need me to do it. Uh, but he knew that I needed something to do. In fact, I needed to, to learn to have a responsibility. So he would check and see if I mowed the lawn, you know, if I had done what, what I was given to do. And uh, he was never critical of the way I did it. Um, the only criticism might come if I didn't do it, if I failed to do it. So he had me mow the lawn, not because he needed it done or, or couldn't do it, but because I needed to do it. I needed to learn how to take care of a responsibility and fulfill a commitment, that kind of thing. I needed to learn how to obey, uh, among other things. If we can understand that, and there might be a lot of other examples of that kind of thing, if we can understand that, I think we can understand the point uh, that God is making with his people in this psalm tonight. Um, it's a very similar kind of point. So beginning at verse 7 again, God says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. That's the way he begins the section where he's dealing with uh, his covenant people. And, um, and God is, you know, he's, he's called them to court. He's passing judgment on them. We might wonder, uh, why is he uh, judging, um, sitting in judgment on his people? Why not just go right to the pagans, you know, that he's going to address later? Why, what kind of problem does God have with his people at this moment? And it seems, as you read the psalm, that it that they're making really the same mistake that the wicked are making. So remember that key verse over verse 21. Um, God says to the wicked, you thought I was just like you. And he condemns that, condemns them for that mistake. And I really think that also applies to his people in a way. They're making the same mistake that the wicked make. What's that mistake? Apparently, God's people, Israel, um, thinks that 
that God is just like them in this way. That is that he in some way needs their worship. He needs their sacrificial offerings. Um, that uh, one way of thinking of it is that, that God gets hungry and he needs the, the animal offerings to eat. Or maybe if it wasn't that uh, blatant of an error, maybe just the idea that in some way he needed their worship. Um, he needed their praise. And that's really a, a pagan way of, of viewing things. But believers can sometimes act like pagans. It, it is a temptation. And it seems like there are times uh, when Israel felt this way, that, that God needed their worship. He needed their offerings, or somehow he was, was less than if he didn't get it. Uh, there was another passage that I thought of in connection with this New Testament text. You remember um, Paul one time went to a very pagan city, the, <coughs> the city of Athens, the ancient city of Athens, and um, and he, he, he worked there, preached there. In fact, uh, one of the famous speeches in the Bible is made by Paul in Athens. Remember, he came into Athens and he was sort of offended. <laughs> Everywhere he looked, there were uh, temples and, and idols. And, and so uh, he addresses them about these things. Uh, he began sort of complimentary. He says, I, I perceive you're very religious people. That's probably about the best thing he could say to them on that occasion. But he begins talking to them about the one true God. And um, one of the things he says, this is Acts chapter 17, verse 24. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And especially that idea that God uh, is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Um, the people in Athens who were idolaters, pagans, needed to, to know that. And apparently it's true that sometimes God's worshipers need to know that. Um, that's what's being addressed here in this middle part of this psalm, okay? Somehow they have the idea that God in some way needs their worship, that that's the purpose of their worship. So just looking again at what it says, Verse 8, uh, back in Psalm 50. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you, God says. Your burnt offerings are continually before me, he says. So that's, that's a verse 8. So whatever we get out of this, God is not saying stop worshiping. He's not calling for them to quit worshiping. He's not saying stop the sacrifices, stop the the singing, whatever it was uh, that was going on. That's not the point. But apparently they have a misunderstanding and they need to understand better what they're doing. It is important for us, is it not, to um, not only sing the songs, but understand what we're singing, correct? Um, we don't just uh, voice words um, because really they're not for God. They're not something he needs, they're for us. Uh, God wants Israel, and no doubt us, to understand worship is for us, not for him. We worship him, but we're the ones who need it. He doesn't need it. And when we get that twisted around, when we somehow think God needs our worship, that we're giving him something that he's lacking or something like that, then, then we've got a real problem. Um, 
a real misunderstanding. So, uh, verse 8, uh, he, says, he basically says, don't stop worshiping, but listen to me. Then this is the way he makes his point. Verse 9, I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. That's a portion of this psalm that I've heard quoted often through the years. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Okay. Um, I've never heard the context explained so, so much, but that phrase, I've heard it many times through the years. But what's God saying? I don't need you to bring uh, one of your bulls or one of your goats because I own them already. Uh, I own every beast in the forest. I own all the cattle on a thousand hills. And then verse 11, I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. I've already got it all, God says. I don't need you to bring it to me. I created it. It belongs to me. Then verse 12, even in a more direct and colorful way, God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Well, it's a rhetorical question, and it's understood that the answer is to be a resounding no, I don't. God does not eat. Uh, he has no need like that. We eat because we need to eat. And some of us eat because we like to eat. But uh, try not eating for very long and you've got a real problem because we have that physical need. God does not. He does not eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. He does not need our prayers and songs and offerings in the sense that he he lacks them somehow. It all belongs to him to begin with. The purpose of worship is to not fulfill, fulfill a need of God. And it seems that Israel had this misunderstanding, at least at some point. Um, but God, God wants our worship. He doesn't want us to stop. He wants our worship, not because he needs it, but because we need it. We were made to do it. We were designed to, to praise and glorify God. And God wants what is best for us. He realizes when we don't do this, when we don't worship, we are hurt. We are much worse off. And so it's something we need, not something he needs. All right? And he just does it in this interesting way where he says, you know, really, are you going to bring me these animals that I already own? I was trying to think of a parallel today in our worship, and it's almost like, uh, you know, our, our financial giving. Um, that probably is the area where we might be most tempted to think, if I don't give, then God's not going to get his work done. Baloney. You know, it's God's anyway. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, whether I give or not. I give because I need to give, um, not because God needs it, okay? And I, to me, at least, uh, that's the one part that would seem most parallel to, to what maybe Israel was experiencing in this ancient time. So you, you sort of get the view of his argument. And then... He's, he wraps up this section, verses 14 and 15, by talking about, okay, I've, I've judged you, I've criticized you here. What am I looking for? Um, verse 14, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So if God is not looking for us to bring uh, bulls and goats and checks and songs. Uh, 
and prayers, all those things. If he's not look, what is he looking for? What do true, true worshipers who really understand what they're doing bring God? Well, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. True worshipers are grateful. They recognize how much God has done for them and they respond in worship. They're grateful. They offer a, a sacrifice of thanks to God because they need to, just like your parents taught you. Uh, to say thank you. Uh, we're the children of God and we need to say thank you. And then the second uh, line of verse 14, and perform your vows to the Most High, true worshipers who understand what they're doing. Yes, they're grateful, they're thankful, but they're also faithful. Uh, in, in the words of the Old Testament system here, perform your vows to the Most High. You've made this vow, this promise to God. Fulfill it. Um, similar today, if we've made promises, commitments uh, to God, then, then we're faithful to those promises and commitments. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for grateful worshipers and faithful worshipers. Faithful worshipers does not mean they always show up on Sunday morning. That's a great thing, but that's not what it means, okay? Faithful worshiper uh, fulfills their commitments to God. They're true to their, go their, their covenant with God. And then verse 15, God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. True worshipers who understand what they're doing Yes, they're grateful, thankful, they are faithful, and they rely on God. They call upon God, um, as it says here, to deliver, and, and in that sense, they glorify him. They recognize how much they need God. They do not have the idea that God needs them. They realize God doesn't need them, that God is merciful to even spend time with them, okay? God um, calls us into relationship with him, not to fulfill some need he has, but because he loves, he's a God of love, and he wants to be in relationship with us. Um, so to sort of sum up, God wants our worship, doesn't need our worship, but wants it because he is God, our God. Verse seven, as, as God introduced himself, I am God, your God. That's a reminder. Uh, I am God, your creator. I, I am in covenant with you. This is who I am. This is why you need to listen to what I'm saying, that kind of thing. So we are in this covenant relationship with God. Covenant is two-sided. God and, and, and his people enter into an agreement in essence. Um, he promises to care for and bless and protect his people. And, and we in turn serve him and worship him because we're thankful and we want to be faithful to him, to him because he's so faithful to us. And so for that reason, we serve him and worship him, not because he needs it. You see, what we're talking about here is a relationship, not a ritual. Ritual is sort of the pagan side of this. To think God needs what I'm doing. God needs me here at 10, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Or in, in the Old Testament, he needs me to show up at the temple with my sacrifice. Uh, in some sense, he needs me. No, that's a ritual. Uh, God has created a relationship with us. And, and when ritual takes center stage in our minds, our relationship with God suffers as a result. Anytime ritual is exalted, relationship suffers. Um, when relationship is primary, that's what God is looking for, all right? 
And so this, again, this sort of two-part uh, courtroom scene where God first speaks to his worshipers uh, and, and says, you've got this problem. I don't want you to stop worshiping. But I want you to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then um, the last part, he turns to the wicked, verses 16 through 23, and he will address their problems, which are different, but both groups seem to have a similar root to their problem, which is in one way or another, they think God is somehow like them. And one of the things we need to root out uh, in ourselves is the idea that God is somehow like me, like you, like us. That's always a source of error when we allow that to occur in us. God is wholly other than us. He is separate from us. He is God, our God. And so he is not like us. Does he love us? Yes. Does he want to be in relationship with us? Yes. But he is the holy and exalted one. We are his servants. And we need to keep that perspective. Uh, so many of the weird ideas that, that are being promoted about God today have their root in this idea that God just wouldn't be different than me. I mean, he wouldn't think different than me, would he? Well, the truth is he would because he's so much greater and so much wiser. And we either submit to that or we don't. So what's in a psalm? Hopefully you're seeing a lot. And uh, next, next week at midweek, we will look at the last part of this, sort of wrap this up. Um, but again, appreciate you having interest in, in this study and, and being a part of it. Hope it's uh, challenging and blessing you. God be with you the rest of this week. We hope to see you in one way or another on the Lord's day as we come before him with worship, which he deserves and which we, we need to give. And we'll see you then.